Hi, thank you for joining me for Bible study. We're going to be looking in the book of Ephesians, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, to be more precise. It is a letter that he wrote, and he wrote it probably with the intent for it not to just stay in Ephesus and the church there, but to be hand copied and passed around. So you won't find as many of the personal uh, touches that you might find in Romans or in Colossians or any of those, but there's a lot in this letter. And so let's work our way through it. It may take us a little while, uh, so we won't get it all done tonight, but we're going to start looking at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. So, a lot of verses there. You ready? Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him, in love having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Whew, that's a long one. And part of the reason it feels so long is that it's not completely translated this way, most likely, in your Bible or mine. But in the Greek, verses 3 through 14, all 12 of those verses, are one single sentence. A continuous thought that when you start reading it and thinking about it that way, it gets a little overwhelming. He had some big thoughts, didn't he? If it took 12 verses to make one sentence. Greek works a little different than it does in English. It's really hard for us to do that in English. But you get the idea. And so, rather than break it up into smaller chunks by just taking a few verses here and there, we're going to kind of do it a different way. We're going to look at, in this case, the subject in this and to see what verbs go with that subject. And the subject is, well, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the subject of this gigantic sentence, meaning he's the one that's doing the action. Now, as we get farther into it, our English translations will make that sound a little different. But here we are. It is him who is in the doing. So let's see what he is doing. And so we start out in the very beginning here. The Father has blessed us 
with every spiritual blessing in the high places, in the heavenlies, in Christ. So one thing that, you know, I printed off a, uh, just those verses and so that I could mark it up more readily. But if you're the type that you have a Bible you can mark up in, it might be interesting to you to go through and circle all the places where you can tell it says in Christ or in him when it's referring to Christ or in whom if it's referring to Christ. And so you kind of have to read carefully for some of those pronouns to know who's being referred to. But all of the actions that the Father is taking are to those who are in Christ. And so that's pretty critical here. So backing up. So who's the subject? The subject is God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is worth pondering for a little bit just because we're used to him being called the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, but why is he called the God of our Lord Jesus Christ? And I think that plays into that picture of, you know, while the word Trinity is not in the scriptures, it's not as simple as our analogies might make us want to think it is. And so Jesus in the flesh as he walked on earth even though he is fully God, yet he submitted to the Father as his God. And so, Paul brings that out in these here, at least in a couple different places. And so, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. You may wonder, well, what blessings is that? Because I don't have these things or I don't uh, feel like I'm adequate in those areas. But it's okay because these are blessings that are treasures in heaven. These are things that are secure in us. And he's going to talk about a number of those blessings as we go through the rest of this sentence. So in some ways, I don't want you to get too caught up in what are the blessings because we're going to talk about what the blessings are. But I do want you to think about how when the Apostle Peter was writing to his people, one of the interesting things that he said is that we have been given... Why don't I just read it to you? In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. But he's given to us everything we need for life and godliness. And so that's a lot of blessings. So, you know, there's a little song in gospel song about count your many blessings you may miss out on some of those blessings because you don't think about the ones that we have for life and godliness and like these here he's blessed us with these kind of blessings in Christ that he has chose us in him before the foundation of the world God handpicked his people. And this is terminology that we find in the Old Testament often. And I wanted to just read a couple of those to you because tomorrow morning when I'm preaching this to our church, a number of them that are there are going through Deuteronomy on Sunday nights. And so some of these verses will be very familiar and some of them will be familiar because we haven't gotten that far in Deuteronomy yet. But start with Deuteronomy 4 and in verse 37 God tells them uh, through Moses and because he loved your fathers therefore he chose their descendants after them and he brought you out of Egypt with his presence with his mighty power 
But because of God's love, he chose them. He made them his nation. 1015 of Deuteronomy. The Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, you above all peoples, as it is this day. Now I bring out that he's saying that in Deuteronomy because one of the things he's going to be revealing in the book, in this letter to the Ephesians, is that God has expanded the circle and yet also defined the circle more closely in that it is those who trust him and believe in him and not just Israelites but Gentiles who trust in him those who have those are the ones he has chosen that they should be holy and blameless before him in love in love having predestined them to adoption this is already leading into our next one isn't it this is one of those blessings the father has chosen in love and he has the father has predestined to adoption now he's going to say a little later in his letter to the ephesians that they are by nature children of wrath that they by nature are sons of disobedience but they've been born again and they've been adopted by grace by his love he has adopted that's a good term even in our culture where this one has been chosen and brought into the family by choice by choice and so it involves a radical change both in nature by God's strength and by law and God's choosing to bring these people in and so our cultural and legal adoption that takes place in our culture is a picture of that fuller work God does when he he got us again to a living hope and has adopted us into his family as his children, sons and daughters. Okay, so we see where he, two of the blessings, he's chosen us, he's predestined. He has also made us accepted in the beloved. Now, he's making us acceptable to himself. And that is a beautiful picture in this but it it really is not speaking of that what speaks of that is when he calls them saints when we ain'ts in that we're not made completely holy yet but he's declaring us to be such and so that's that picture of being accepted by god but this word is only used twice in all the New Testament, and the other use of it gives us a better clue of what is really being said here. And that's in Luke chapter 1. Luke, in the Gospels, chapter 1. Well, if you know that address, you know, this isn't talking about Jesus. Jesus isn't even born in Luke chapter 1. But the angel appeared to the virgin named Mary and said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. That term, highly favored one, is our word here, being made acceptable. Highly favored 
by God. And it is, in the Greek, speaking of a tremendous outpouring of grace to one. The Lord has poured out all of this grace on this young woman that she might be the mother of the Son of God. And the Apostle Paul This word is the one he chooses here to apply to all of those who are in Christ. We've been given a similar pouring of grace upon us. Just so highly favored by God. And undeserving of it at that. Okay? So... Verse 4, he chose us. Verse 5, he's predestined. Verse 6, he's made us accepted. He's highly favored us. And in this one, in verse 8, he has made to abound toward us. Now, the way that sentence is phrased, though, the Father is made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence something. Well, what was it? Well, it's what precedes verse 8, and that's there in verse 7. He, what did he make to abound toward us? Redemption and forgiveness of sins, the riches of his grace. So, which he made to abound toward us. So, first off, redemption. He has purchased us, redeemed us. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, as the old gospel song says. And that purchasing includes, as you'll notice there, he's putting these connected, that they kind of are meaning the same thing in his mind. That redemption is the forgiveness of sins. He's paid the price to forgive us of all our sins. And so, the forgiveness of sins, redemption, according to what? Riches of his grace. He purchased it with his grace. How? With the blood of Jesus Christ. Through his blood. And so, he has made something to abound toward us, has he not? But he's also made known to us the mystery. Because this wasn't fully clear from the Old Covenant. It was written throughout it, but it wasn't spelled out so much that it would, you know, places like Isaiah 53, it was pretty close to spelled out. But it was fully revealed in Christ. Made known, revealed. What he had purposed... In himself, he has made known, he has purposed these things that in the fullness of time he might gather together in one all things in Christ. Now, this is building up. He's made known what he has purposed, what he's predetermined. He has this plan that he's going to gather all things together. And as you read on, you read where it's talking about that both Jews and Gentiles by faith will be one people being reconciled. But it's bigger than that even in this context. Because in the immediate context, he says that he is working all things according to the counsel of his will. Now, that almost sounded like Romans 8, 28. He works all things together for good to those who love the Lord, the called according to his purpose. And that's a big picture verse as well. But here we see where he is bringing everything to a culmination that it's the sum up of all of history lands 
end in Christ. There is an ending, and it is glorious. And that kind of where we want to borrow from Philippians, his letter there, that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But it, there is a destination here. And he is the one who is gathering all things together. And again, that's a complicated Greek word where it's kind of hard to bring a, a definition to it. But it's speaking of consummation, a summing up. There's all the strings coming together. Like that Romans 8, 28. Even the bad. The bad isn't actually good, but the bad can be used to make something good. And so we want to be a part of that. We want to be experiencing that good. We and so, how will we do that? Well, we'll talk more about that next week. But I want you to notice there in verses 13 and 14 that it's we who trusted, and it's you also who trusted, because you heard the word and you believed the word. And the Holy Spirit is at work to make that happen. There's a lot going on in this. I just scratched the surface, I feel like. But today we praise God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because he has blessed us with all these things. So let's praise him for it. I appreciate you joining me. It's kind of gone long today, but God bless you. And God keep you as you contemplate God's blessings toward those who are in Christ. I hope that includes you. See you next time.